Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, August 14th, 2014 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, I will begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll. Present. Mr. Downey Meyer. Ms. Lisa Miller. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Carrie Laporta. Here. Mr. Andrew Shuffle. Here. Mr. Edward Hockey. And Mayor David Markwood. Present. Okay, excellent. Um, the next item on the agenda is the public comment period. Is there anyone here from the public who wishes to speak? I don't think I see anyone, so we'll move on. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Okay, no announcements. So we'll move right into the recommended actions uh, portion of the agenda, and in particular, our consent agenda. We have several items on that consent agenda this evening. We have the school committee meeting minutes of July 10th, 2014, and then we have a series of uh, contracts, um, a LPVEC contract for municip Medicaid Municipal Reimbursement Filing Services, not to exceed $24,000. Automated Logic for the NHS Energy Automation Systems, $148,849. Normando Technologies for installation of cables for wireless internet at the high school, $24,775.80. R&H Roofing, a uh, contract amendment to replace wet roof insulation at Ryan Road School, $4,795. Uh, Rustic Fire Protection, Inc. for school sprinkler maintenance and inspections, $5,750. K-12 K Insight, Let's Talk, cloud-based communication software, $9,000 per year, not to exceed three years. Sign Techniques Incorporated for the NHS Electronic Sign and LED Message Center, $19,815. And then State Street Fruit Store, produce for NPS and Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School food programs, $40,000. Third Sector New England Professional Development for Bridge Street Teachers, $11,850. Heinemann Publishing K-8 Literacy Instructional Materials, $33,355.11. And All-Star Dairy Foods for, again, uh, Northampton Public Schools and Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School Food Service Programs Dairy, $100,000. We also have a field trip request for the Jackson Street 5th grade attending Nature's Classroom in Beckett, Massachusetts, October 14th through the 17th of 2014. I would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor of accepting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The consent agenda is adopted. David, we now move in. Oh, go ahead. Could I just make one quick comment you again sure. for our new members? Sure. Which is that. Um, Notice that there was Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative is doing our Medicaid reimbursement billing. Um, it's something that would be very um, time consuming, labor intensive, and time consuming for the district to do itself. It used to be done by the collaborative here in Northampton, but they chose to go in different directions. And so Lower Pioneer is the one that's doing it. So that's why it's not for the CES, and that's why, but it is okay. a legitimate thing. <laughs> It, it brings that money back into the district, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for providing that information. Okay, the um, next we'll move on to reports and recommendations. Uh, and we have a series of um, uh, votes regarding the 2014 2015 school handbooks. Uh, and seeing we first handbooks were the elementary school. Um, I just saw someone walk. Uh, right on time, right on schedule as always. Uh, Principal Sal Canada is here uh, and uh, here to speak about the, um, the school hand. <laughs> no, you're right on time. Perfect timing. It was kind of funny. I was, so my son has a baseball game. So he's playing okay. baseball. And I'm looking at my watch and I'm, he's, he's, he's down the order a little bit. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Look at the watch. All right, finally, he gets up to bat. He walked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you got on base. <laughs> or <laughs> so. Okay. Well, we'll let you boot up and uh, 
So this is a presentation of the school handbooks for the elementary schools. I believe all the members have uh, received those in their packets. Okay. Um, what I did do, I don't want to jump. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. What I did do is you did you did receive those courtesy of Laura, but then I also I did like a, just a really brief summary um, that you can reference the, uh, the changes with. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So that being said, um, or that that being handed out, I'd just like to say um, good evening, and, I, and I'm pleased to present this on behalf of uh, my colleagues at the middle school. It is a newly edited handbook. Um, and the changes came about for a couple of reasons, and they're actually pretty straightforward. First of all, the four of us, myself, Gwen Agna, Beth Chiquette, and Sarah Madden, um, we said it needed to be cleaned up a little bit. And when I mean that, I guess made more, more user-friendly, easier to follow. So that was the first reason. And we started doing that in the fall, and that was more along the lines of some code of conduct things and the way it was presented. But then secondly, and more importantly, what drove this was that there's been changes in laws educational policies and procedures. So under the advisement of our legal counsel, that's Ginny Tate, uh, she must have painstakingly uh, gone over all the handbooks in district, the three uh, from the high school, middle school, and of course ours. Um, and she came back with some suggested changes that we looked at. So first I'm gonna acknowledge that Julie Clark, my administrative assistant at Leeds, she helped with the documentation and aligning it and typing. And again, I want to thank my colleagues for who trusted me to put this together. So um, I did that. So I know that Laura had given you the, the new document with the highlights in yellow, and that, that should make things a heck of a lot easier for all of us. Um, but in a nutshell, as it says on this document here, um, we changed some, all of these things came about simply because of either to clean it up, to make it user friendly, or because it was law. So. The, the parts <coughs> that are listed here, student records is all right from policy. Um, the attendance wording is right from policy. Keeping students after school was something that we chose to, to put in um, about notifications. Um, the rules on special education and promotion, I'm sorry, special education and 504s came right from our legal counsel, as, as did the wording on promotion and promoting kids. The wording on volunteerism, uh, and that references VINs and, vo and general parent volunteers who come in, that came from within, as did the visitor policy. Um, exclusion, I'm trying to remember what the exclusion thing went. So let me skip ahead. Oh, I thought someone said something. Let me just check my notes on exclusion so I know that I'm, in what context I'm speaking. Oh, that, Exclusion, it comes about, this was from legal counsel. It's about student immunization. If students are not up to date with their immunization, families whose, the added line, the highlighted line is families whose religious beliefs preclude the students from being immunized are precluded from this particular exemption. So again, that was a legal recommendation. Uh, some changes were made with regard to um, medication in the schools. And then the bullying policy, I, I wanna stop just for a second here. The bullying policy is completely changed um, in its presentation and in its wording, but I don't believe that the way we approach it, being proactive, is any different. Um, and I'm gonna step back and say Northampton, and I'm gonna look around, I think, it's my 10th time doing this, and Lisa, you're the only one who's still here. <laughs> but when we first, did, uh, we first did the bullying policy in Northampton, we really took the lead. Karen Jarvis Vance, um, Director of Health and Safety, among other, uh, she was she took the lead, and I worked with her pretty close on that to create the the bowling policy in in the city, which later became a model for the state. So now, the state has changed it just a little bit, tweaked it just a little bit. So as a result, the work that we did a couple years ago has been been watered down a little bit. I honestly think Northampton had a little more teeth in our policy than the state does, but it doesn't change the fact that we'll address it and uh, properly, and appropriately, and swiftly. Um, the code of conduct on page 
44 is now aligned with the, the middle and the high school with one simple line, and I think my colleagues would appreciate this. The simple line is as deemed necessary, um, I believe it's as deemed necessary by the principal or the, the person who is delving out the discipline, but let me just get to that. Oh, the word is very simple, discretion. The consequences and interpretation of the rules are up to the discretion of the principal and or head teacher at the elementary level. And what I think that really speaks to is we know these kids. We know that we know what's good for them. We know um, if there has to be a consequence of some kind, we can probably pick it out. It doesn't have to be very black and white, and you have some leeway with that. And, and that really is, uh, that, that wording is also aligned with the uh, new chapter 222, which talks about how, we, how we're supposed to address kids in, with regard to suspensions. Um, lastly, they changed the definition of a threat the state did, so we changed that. And how to discipline students who are on a 504 plan also came from Ginny Tate. The last piece that isn't highlighted in your handbook is the very last page, and I, for some reason we just forgot to, but it's just simply the personnel. Uh, this is the first time in my, I think my, my recollection, that it's going into September 1st with all the spaces filled, we know who's working in what job, there's no interims, there's no temporaries. So I just, it just uh, slipped my mind not, not to note that as, as new. So that's it. Okay. Are there any uh, questions for uh, Principal Kanata about the uh, handbook for the elementary schools? Okay. Yes, Mr. Moore. Okay. Um, the first, I had, I do, I read, this is the one that I actually read to, and I had a couple of like typos. Could I sure. give them to you? Not now, not now. Yeah, yeah, please. Some other time? Um, I, I mean, I assume they were typos, unless they, um, and then I did have a couple of, one, one question, um, or a comment I, went, I think you should look into. On page 25, under 504 plans, um, there's a little clause uh, regarding, um, sort of unlike special ed eligibility, um, I actually think that may be a misstatement of the law. So you should check and see the, the highlighted statement part. of the law regarding special ed eligibility. It wasn't the focus of the paragraph. Um, it's just a student does not have to demonstrate a lack of academic progress um, to get accommodations. You know, my understanding of the law is that social and emotional development would be addressed by a special ed plan, uh, even if the child were making academic pro pro progress. So you should check and see what what the official position okay. of the school is on that law. Um, and then I had a question for the superintendent. There were a couple of things where it referred to the school committee doing things, which I don't think we've done since we've been on the school committee. Um, there was one where the school committee approved bus stop locations. Mm -hmm. I don't recall ever voting on a bus stop location. There was another where the school committee um, recommends optimal class sizes. I don't think we've done that. We've talked about them. We've we have guidelines. We do not have a set policy that states, but we definitely have guidelines about what we'd like to see. Okay, so I wasn't really clear anyway, the recommending optimal class. I didn't know. If yeah, we I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, and there were a couple other places like that in the book that would be sort of a question for the superintendent or, the, you know. Sure. Uh, it's either we need to start doing them or they shouldn't say we do them in the book. Or, yeah. I, I would like to take a stab at that. Um, first of all, thank you for the question. I, I agree with you that if the school committee is not in the position of making determinations, we shouldn't have a handbook that says that the school committee is making the determinations. So um, I think those would be good deletions. Also, I would just like to point out that as part of the legal review that we had for all three handbooks, one of the things that Attorney Tate had told us is it's actually not required that the school committee approve the handbooks. That um, it, it, the authority to do that is really vested in the school improvement councils. Um, every district I've been in, the school committee does do um, the student handbooks, but um, it may be a good time to think about the practice of maybe just um, putting this, the decision making on the student handbooks with the school improvement councils as we've been advised um, it should more appropriately be. And then this is the first time an elementary book has been presented. Yeah, okay. and I have the 
a, a third overarching one which isn't specific to this handbook, but it's something. Um, as I was reading through the three handbooks, there are, some of them have the boilerplate that's slightly different, but it's boilerplate, and it would be really, I think, good if the boilerplate was the same, so that, so that it, you know, so that if we generally if we always say this, that it's really truly what we always say, as opposed to when you, you know, because it should be the same. It wasn't. It wasn't specific to elementary students or specific to high school students. It was, you know, policy. We so so if, if at some point the um, the school councils wanted to uh, do a big project of looking at the the alignment of our uh, handbooks, that would be wonderful. This was that was a actually a pretty big step forward with Ginny's intervention in the spring, mm -hmm. and I think you'll see some similarities. And it, and it seems like it could maybe get Even better. More. Ms. Minnick. Are we down to the deadline for, for getting it printed? You know, that's... So, I mean, I was going to say, my guess is that Howard would probably agree that the handbook could be printed and that we should look for it at <laughs> these things for future... Oh, yeah, most of these changes are... Um, for future if editions. If now, but <laughs> yes. like for the... Yeah, but not, not to hold up the, the process this <laughs> summer, but... Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't want to totally speak for him. But um, and my guess is that some of the stuff about school committee may be, for instance, we don't actually sit there and approve school bus stops. But I think we have policy guidelines that may put a fine point on where a bus stop should be, so that it's not on a busy street or it's In the not distance apart from you know, each other. Yeah, exactly. Stuff like so. I don't know that for certain. <laughs> But it may be that some of the stuff that refers to the school committee is actually referring to our policy guidelines. Mm -hmm. But it should be checked if it says school committee right, in there. Yeah. I'm not sure so. if it didn't, it didn't belong. It's just um, but the only other comment I wanted to make was just thank you for representing your colleagues oh. and for the work they did, for the work that you did, and for the work that your clerk did. Because I know it seems to me that my that the elementary school handbooks were specific and individual to each school there was not one that worked for everybody they had their own personalities so um, to Howard's point at least all the elementary schools now are consistent in the way things are presented and that works for parents if they're moving from one school to another so I appreciate the work that you all did thank you that's the goal um, if I could just say with regard to printing yeah, it, it's about a week and a half to seven to ten days to get it done. However, what we did last year is we put them all on our, we, we put them online, and then we kept several, you know, a dozen or so, if needed, in, in the office. And there was, uh, we, through uh, the listserv, we sent them all to families where they could acknowledge and do a sign off then and just bring in a sign in sheet, safe paper. So that's also a consideration before we go to print with such a. Mammoth. I mean, I assumed that you could make the typographical changes that he yep. referenced, but I, if you have to go back and review, right. okay. you know, some other more All right. difficult. Comments. So I do want to. I did want to take up the superintendent's the issue the superintendent raised, which was should we be approving them if the if the loss if the ed reform law says that it's actually the school councils that approve them. So would that mean then that raises the point does do four school councils have to approve this unified, um, this unified handbook, or how does that work? So that's how that's okay. Did, what are folks' thoughts about that? Or? Well, four school councils would have to approve it, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. But then you get back to those individual councils could then start individualizing this thing, and we'd go back the opposite direction again. So mm -hmm. there's a part of me that likes this. I don't like that we don't have to approve the district, I mean the uh, school improvement plans. I don't even like that that's been removed from our purview, so I'm not sure how I feel about having no authority. I, I, I'm, I'm shocked, frankly, that the attorney said that it's not our decision to make because we've always done it, so I'm, I don't know. I'll He's smirking. <coughs> I'm smiling because you're the pre-ed reform know, school committee member. I'm the one who always wants to hold on to exactly. all the authority yeah. that the school committee had, and but I'm, it concerns I'm, me yeah. that it's being chipped away from all sides, little bits, and you know we're an elected body that represents mm -hmm. the public, mm -hmm. and to the extent that um, I think that school councils sir, provide a great service, 
they are supposed to be advisory to their principals, and I think that um, every time we transfer, seed some of our authority to them, and that's not us doing it, but it's the state that's mandating it, but I think that it changes the dynamic and it calls into question why do we have an elected school mm -hmm. board if we're not going to have much authority so I'm just trying <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be around that much longer I'm not, you know just like all over tomorrow <laughs> but but um, or I might forget everything I know but needless to say I really do think that it, I mean I for future generations I think that we need to be cautious about how the how this goes. Well, as, I guess I'll just say as chair, I, I haven't seen her opinion. I may just take a chance to review it just to hear the rationale for it. So yeah. um, I just don't want us to create work for for principals if this is if there's already a in process envision for how it should be it should be done. So okay, great. If I could. Um, do you still have time to get back to the game? No, okay. okay. Uh, if I could, one thing you said about going back to the old way of doing things. Um, one thing we did start, was it two years ago? Mm -hmm. Or last year? We do a joint school council meeting with all four schools. That could be our that could be our item agenda. That could be mm -hmm. our, our big ticket item. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Mr. Right. Okay, so the next item uh, is the JFK uh, student handbook. Uh, and uh, uh, Scott Andrew is here, associate. And uh, Celeste and I were wondering if we might present together because so many of the recommendations from Ginny impacted both the handbooks. That, that's fine. If the committee's amenable to that, that's fine. Thank you. So we're listening to JFK. Thank you. I think these are just JFK. Thanks. She's got the high school, but he said okay. that he would. Okay. So, so, thank you. Thank you. So let me uh, start by echoing what uh, Sal said which is that the majority of these changes, especially the significant changes, are as a result of attorney recommendation and attorney language being provided for the handbooks to make them more consistent. Um, also in the intro there, I state that some of the subsections and paragraphs have been moved around. I didn't make note of all those moves, but um, similar to what Sal said, to make the handbook flow better and to give it a little um, tighter organization, some things were moved around. Um, and then lastly, as I look at these and looked at the highlighted version that I believe you got, I think in the back and forth, um, a couple of these highlights disappeared and you may not have gotten these minor changes that are noted early on here um, in your version. So I'll answer any questions you might have if, if that's the case. So the first one um, is the attendance policy. Our previous handbook referenced at length the uh, school is where it's at program that the district attorney's office used to run uh, for students who were excessively absent. And the district attorney closed, uh, office closed that program down. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, so that has been removed from the handbook. And what I did was uh, make very clear um, the definitions of excused absence and unexcused absence and added a, a heading there for specifically the interventions that we do use to address excessive absences and tardies. The next uh, entry there, page six and eight, the health office school nurse. Some of these changes were referenced by Sal. There were four changes made. Um, one, uh, we inserted language from Ginny Tate that some health issues uh, could be a potential disability that would qualify the student for 504. Um, another one from Ginny was a revision of our in-home and in-hospital educational services when those services are required to be provided. Um, and then there were two changes in the language, three changes in the language by Karen Jarvis Vance regarding the distribution of medication in school and the process that needs to be gone through for that. Um, the keeping and destroying or returning of health records and when children are excluded from school due to lack of immunizations. And as Sal said, the uh, 
um, exception for that for the religious beliefs of the families were included. Um, next, under safety and security, um, Attorney Tate uh, provided a definition of contraband to include in the handbook. Um, she gave a more thorough description of our right to search both uh, school property and students, and um, she <coughs> provided a lengthy description of our surveillance uh, system that's going to be installed and um, how that would be managed here at the school. Um, on page 14, she ex provided language to extend the, the definition and give some examples of forgery. Um, there was a change in state law regarding uh, gender identity being a protected class. So uh, gender identity has been inserted in any uh, non-discrimination clause in the handbook. I'm sorry, Celeste, I'm That's going okay, on here, I but a couple of these, the health office and the gender identity ones are, are ones that are they're also all, in the yeah, high school all the same. That's, that's handbook. Um, under unacceptable behaviors in the code of conduct section, um, there was a reference to alcohol. Alcohol was included in the section under 30, chapter 37H, um, and it's not actually included in state law under sec chapter uh, 37H, section 37H rather. Um, so it was moved to a separate section. Uh, the consequences remained the same. Changed a uh, little bit of language. Um, there was a clause that said using or being under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And we decided in our school council meeting that using, to use alcohol or drugs, you need to be in possession of and that that would actually fall under the in possession of. So we removed the words using or in that section. On page 20, under transportation violations, um, oftentimes if an infraction occurs on the bus, the student is not, if it's a serious infraction, the student is not just looking at a, a letter notifying the parents or a possible exclusion from the bus, but they're um, subject to regular disciplinary consequences as described in the other section of the handbook. So we did make note of that and said in addition to the consequences cited above and then included the possibilities for their bus consequences. Then the suspension and expulsion procedures. This was probably the most extensive revision to the handbook that took place due to the new state regulations chapter, uh, due to law chapter 222 um, and the regulations um, written by the state. So we made all of our language on suspensions um, be consistent with the state law and state education regulations. Um, essentially, there are more hearings um, that students are entitled to and appeal procedures that are very spelled out. I don't know if you want to add any details to that. So. Okay. okay, so our, our language for several of these upcoming sections are going to be identical language in the middle school handbook and the high school handbook and it was language that was provided uh, directly by Ginny or that we worked out in um, cooperation with each other. Uh, the right to educational services during suspensions and expulsions, that is new due to Chapter 222. Um, Ginny gave us language for that. Um, the discipline for students with disabilities, she also provided greater clarification on that language, which we included. Um, an extensive replacement of language regarding student records was inserted. Um, it's, it's much more detailed in describing um, our obligations and the procedures of, of handling student records. And then under special education in section 504, um, we inserted language that defines the child find mandate and the referral process that we go through when a student is struggling in school, the, the referral steps that, or the, the steps, intervention steps that we take um, that could lead to a referral for uh, special ed or 504. And finally, the bullying policy, which Sal referenced, uh, that uh, policy um, language is consistent now from elementary school, middle school, and high school. I, I believe it was before, but as Sal said, the, the laws 
has changed and we, we modified that language at recommendation of Attorney Tate. Okay. Yes. I didn't think to ask this when Sal was presenting, but now that I'm looking at it again, um, the, the whole section on student records, did um, someone from our technology department look at that? Because don't we have a fair amount of information that's, that's um, held electronically? And we have, I, I just want to be sure that they know what the restrictions are, that they are aware, and that we're, that nothing in this policy, it didn't look like it at first blush, but I want to be sure that there's nothing there that would put us at risk for noncompliance because of electronic storage of information or access by others who manipulate that information? You know what I'm saying? No. Because <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, we do, you know, it says that certain people have access to student data. And I guess what I'm saying is I don't know how it's stored, I don't know by whom, and I don't know if there are clerks or other technical people that are dealing with that information and if that is considered in this. Can someone address that? I believe the majority of the student records that are referenced in, in that statement are the CUME folder records, and those are kept in the, the CUME folder. Okay. So not those wouldn't be like these wouldn't be things on the student information system that would be accessible to a wider the, the things that would be in the the student information system would be like report cards transcripts attendance records and the transcript becomes part of the cumulative folder section but Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions about uh, the JFK changes? Uh, I just noted, I don't know, maybe it's intentional, but the exclusion policy in the elementary school says for religious reasons you can be excused. The middle school one says the same thing, but it references a form that's available in the nurse's office. I don't know if that's because maybe there's no form available in the school nurse's office or not, but it just seems, okay, to your point about boy, it should be a little bit consistent maybe. Mm. <clears throat> that was probably more for Sal maybe. Okay. So it sounds like it's in, oh, it's, in it's in the JFK, it's in the middle school one. Okay. It's a reference to the form, but it's not in the elementary school waiver being obtained mm -hmm. from the school nurse? Correct. Mm. Okay. Seems like an easy one to fix. Like, like, yeah. I don't know, maybe I missed it, but you know, the that opening, the introductory language saying you will be deemed to have read this, it was added. At the that page. is at the back of High our school. That's at the back of the JFK one. It's, it's <laughs> on the form that uh, oh, on we're requesting form. this, on the consent form, or on the, yeah, the I have verification form. of receipt form. And, and I didn't see it in the elementary book either. And it was one of those, again, one of those odd things. One of the, the things we realized in this review process is that we, and we, we, I think we took a lot of steps in this direction this round, but I, I believe there, there are probably more opportunities to make everything as consistent as possible, the, the format, the language, the clauses, and, and to put clauses like that in, in the same place. That looks like one we missed. Exactly. But I think, I think in next year's round, we'll, be cognizant of right. that I and that just sort of make that sort of a goal to try to because I mean I understand when you're drafting them you're just drafting the one for your school and so this project of you know looking at the other two sort of levels and trying to sort of see you know if the, again just sort of the point of view of a parent you know if, if it's kind of a rule that's true for the whole district it's nice if it seems like <laughs> it's presented as though it's a rule that's true for the whole district. I agree. Okay. So any other questions to, for the uh, for the middle school handbook at this point? Okay. Do you want to transition over to the high school? Yeah. Oh. 
So I, I um, thanks, Scott. Um, I think my uh, approach here will be just to kind of skip over all the stuff that's been covered already through uh, Sal and Scott. So, um, you know, an introduction. Yes, I got a lot of information back from the attorney, um, a lot of information to be added, um, things that uh, either were missing in the handbook or because of new laws, um, you know, like the new discipline laws um, and those regulations, stuff that needed to be added, a lot of stuff that needed to come out, maybe old, outdated, uh, no longer law, those kind of things that were still um, uh, nested in there. And uh, a lot of things that just needed some minor revision, changes in language. Um, so I made all those changes, and a lot of that, uh, again, was covered by Sal and Scott. Um, being uh, just finishing my first year here, um, I just took the approach of picking maybe a few small things um, that I wanted to focus on in terms of changes, uh, content changes for the high school, and I'll go over those uh, briefly. Um, and other than that, it was a lot of formatting, a lot of uh, reorganization, a lot of things move from one location to another, or um, you know, the order of things, the table of contents, just to make it more uh, user friendly um, uh, for those who read the handbook or reference the handbook. Um, and also, uh, in mind, I had uh, this year. I uh, I hope to uh, establish a handbook revision committee. Uh, with students, staff, um, parents or guardians, just I think it's time to kind of go through, look at some of our school-based policies um, and what would we like to see, uh, you know, down the road and do things need any changes. And so part of my goal was to try to organize it and make it user-friendly so that when I go to sit down with this committee that we're not doing a lot of back and forth, trying to find things that it's, it's easy to read and easy to uh, begin that process. So um, I, I, I handed out um, just a little hand back, a, hand, a handout that went through um, uh, the specifics of what was highlighted in the, uh, in the electronic version that you got of the new handbook. So the first one was the, the handbook acknowledgement clause that's right in the inside cover. Um, basically just, uh, uh, just a statement that, that families or students can't use not signing the form as an excuse. So it goes to everybody, everybody has access to it, and we have to uh, assume that they have read it and understand it. Um, page six is the grade record and promotion policy. So a lot of that was cleaning up language. Um, there was an addition, uh, additional reference to the right of special ed students to participate in graduation um, and related activities. Uh, one of the bigger things under there was uh, a promotion requirement change. And um, it sounds, I think, uh, bigger than it is. And basically, our policy has been um, seven credits uh, to be promoted to 10th grade, 14 credits to be promoted to 11th grade, and 21 credits to be promoted to, uh, to 12th grade. And that's seven out of eight credits a year, basically, or you can get eight credits in a year successfully. Um, but what we notice and what's been happening is when you say 21 credits to be a senior, uh, and you can successfully earn eight credits during your senior year. You, you know, it's silly to start as a junior when you can graduate <clears throat> with your class. So we left everything the same and moved that to just 20 credits to graduate. It just made a lot more sense um, practically and, and, you know, and the whole, you know, reporting every detail to the state as we have to now uh, electronically is sort of you're holding someone back and then by, you know, January they're promoted and it just seems silly. So uh, that was... Again, uh, it, it sounds like a, a larger change than it is, but that was a change uh, to a policy. The graduation requirements were only changed uh, slightly uh, to match the um, changes in curriculum and the writing uh, required writing course that came out and the wellness one and two, switching to just uh, one wellness course. Uh, the honesty and academic integrity policy, that was really just a rewrite. Um, it was two policies that are now combined. It was, I, I think it was academic ethics and, uh, and honesty. There were two different sections and, and Chris Brennan, our other associate principal, actually took time to write that uh, with clarity. Uh, we didn't have very much in our handbook about National Honor Society and in fact this year um, the uh, National Honor Society wrote and um, accepted a new set of bylaws. 
and so I was able to uh, insert some information. The attorney was um, particularly concerned about not having anything in there um, in terms of dismissal. If a student could be removed from National Honor Society, how would that be? So um, I added in the eligibility, the selection, and the dismissal. I thought that seemed you know, a little more positive than just adding the negative. But uh, so I added that in there. Uh, small change with just the section on report cards and progress reports. We had put in specific dates of when they would be issued. And I would say most of the time it, that doesn't ever happen on those specific dates, just weather, technology issues and such. So I just noted um, that that can vary and so tried to outline, you know, by the weeks when that typically happens and let them know that they could always call to, uh, to find out some more detailed information. Uh, attendance, um, again, a lot of um, just clarifying language, uh, you know, differences between excused and unexcused, the waiver process. Um, one of the things that I did add that had not been there was language around um, us um, in the, the main office accepting notes for excused absences when students return to school. And that's not a practice that's been happening at the high school. Um, uh, what we do is we sort of wait until the end and if a student has exceeded our minimum uh, attendance requirements then we say okay bring in your notes at the end and we'll try to you know if you're under you know then then we're okay we'll, we'll make a note of that if not then you know fill out this waiver and go ahead no, okay you finish your sentence okay <laughs> um, and then uh, you know we'll do this waiver process and and uh, you know we collect all the documentation at the end um, I'm not making a significant change to that process at this point, but I am just saying, listen, if you have notes, bring them in when you come back so that we can go ahead and market medical or market excuse so that it's not counting all semester long as um, an unexcused absence. It's really confusing, I think, for students and families. They get letters very frequently about being um, you know, in excess or close to the requirements, um, attendance re exceeding the attendance requirements. Um, and oftentimes those are for uh, legitimate reasons. And so uh, that's just the first step. Do you want me to wait until the end or can I ask her a question on attendance policy right now? Go right ahead, I think it's fine. This, the attendance policy has just been an administrative nightmare for about eight to 10 years, I think. And it, it got better a couple of years ago when it got clearer. And this seems like it's making it clearer yet. So I'm happy to see that. But I just want to confirm that if my child has a cold or an upset stomach and stays home, and I write a note saying they were sick, that's not an excused absence. It has to be a note from a physician. Correct. And so that means that it has to be a serious illness for it to be an excused absence. So then that's why this thing says that uh, you lose credit after X number of unexcused absences. So that's like a cold that keeps you out for five days plus an upset stomach plus, you know, Correct. something else a couple of times. Now you've got, but if you get mono and you have to stay home and the doctor writes a note, you're okay with that. Right. Okay. So you, you have the nine uh, because we know things happen. You know, you get sick and you don't always run to the doctor. Right. You, you know, someone is ill, your dog, you know, there's things that happen and you stay home from school. And so we, you have a buffer built in. Um, what I think uh, families have the hardest time with is that you have this buffer built in where you, you miss a few days of school, but then you want a vacation for seven days and now suddenly you're over and that buffer doesn't seem as, as lenient anymore. Right. But it really is, it's there so that you, those things can happen and it's okay. And it would only be that if you exceeded nine in a semester that you would you know, be required to submit some documentation for that, yeah. Do you know if the area physician practices are upset that they have to keep writing these notes for people that are out sick for three or four days? Is that a problem? I mean, I, don't I think, I don't we, know their I think the state about it. is putting I us can, in yes. a position that we, ha we can't allow kids to be out just willy-nilly. So I mean, I think we have to do this. Mm -hmm. But I think it's putting them in a position as well, because I know families are calling them quite a bit. And uh, so we get notes that, we had a lot of notes that say, I heard from so-and-so who confirmed that their child was home from school today, which is not the same as I saw so-and-so, <laughs> right. you know. Yeah. Okay. 
And yes. If I could just respond to that. Um, I, I do think it's the former um, situation that may place physicians in kind of an ethical dilemma. But I think for legitimate physician visits, I think it's just part of the practice. Now, I know that whenever I've seen a doctor in the last four or five years, the last thing they ask me is, do you need a note for work? So I think it's just yes. part of the practice now. I, I guess for me, can I speak? I'm sorry. Oh, please, yes. I, I just don't like the policy. I mean, if a kid gets a 92 and was absent 15 days, I don't know. I, the grade represents that they were competent in those skills. And that I'm, as a parent, very, I have a lot of flexibility in my, well, I don't, my partner has a lot of flexibility in her schedule to take her kids to the doctor that it, I feel like it becomes a bureaucratic nightmare and a parental exercise. Um, and that if a student is able to do the work and get those grades, so it's really about the credit. I mean, if a kid, yeah, they get the grade. They get the, so I just, mm -hmm. I think. The grade gets factored into the, the GPA, the, the, the grade is there. But it's also the state. The state says if a student is absent more than a certain number of times, don't we have to do, there's something in there, I think. Is that the state telling us? I, I didn't think it was a state. There are state it's requirements. It's required to have intervention policies. Actually. Intervention policies, yeah. No, I, I know that. And it's just that I feel like some people it's easier to get documentation than others. And we're still saying a kid could be suspended for 10 days and do it. It's just, and this isn't a point for you to, I have a problem with <laughs> yeah. a kid being able to get a 91 and doesn't get the credit for it, That's or an 81. Um, and it becomes more of a parental organizational exercise than a 14-year-old exercise. And then you can also ask that the kid that misses 15 or 20 days of school is getting a 91 or a 92 in a class. And what is that saying, too? Yeah. It's, all, it's all things that we yeah, have to no, consider. Yeah, no, it depends. I think it depends. The student or the right, curriculum or, I don't know. So I'll continue, but if you have other questions. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. And, and I, will, I, I will, before I guess, before I continue, we'll say that uh, the attendance policy in general is one of my, really getting to the bottom of that and making some changes is one of my goals for this year. And, um, you know, uh, only uh, through some recommendation and positive suggestions from Dr. Provost that I not do that unilaterally, uh, unilaterally on my own, which is what I was itching to do. <laughs> I will wait. Um, and do the right thing and sort of look, you know, to the school council and get some other people involved. But it is, uh, it, it's it all is about lacking. The process. Yes. <laughs> so that said, um, there are some things about makeup work guidelines um, specific from the attorney that you can read. Um, go. This is all stuff that was um, mentioned already. The next uh, section, um, page 22, starts the code of conduct. Um, which would be another section that I really want to delve into uh, with the committee uh, this year. Um, you know, again, I think this is what Sal had, had mentioned. Um, there's a clause in there that talks about, um, you know, administration, administration having the right to, uh, to modify penalties as needed um, or to impose other uh, penalties such as uh, detentions or loss of cons uh, privileges or extracurriculars, that kind of thing, service requirements, um, you know, just to, uh, you know, add additional levels to um, progressive discipline. Um, and that being said, I did uh, and will be initiating an office detention at the high school this year. We don't have an after school detention option um, or did not have, so I, I'm working with our. Um, ESP who does our in-school suspensions um, on a modified s sort of day to uh, he'll be staying twice a week um, to do an office attention staying late and uh, so a number of these uh, violations and consequences that are listed the class cut defiance tardiness um, those are all just listed here because they've been modified um, to reflect the initiation of office detention. So instead of a first level being a, you know, a day or period of in-school suspension or something like that, it uh, will start off as an office detention. And I tried to give them a range, you know, on some of these consequences to uh, allow for some flexibility. But so there's nothing really big there just to reflect the, the detention. And then there was a few, um, Four, I believe, uh, violations that I added to the code of conduct only because, um, you know, need, frequency, just things that I found that came up 
uh, a few times this year that I wish that I had something more specific to go to. Um, but that's just a start and again something that I want to look at with the committee um, to go through what we have, what we don't have, what we would like to add or delete or change. And I think, let's turn the page here, I think uh, everything else uh, that I had listed has been covered and it was all recommendations from the attorney. So are there any other? Any other questions regarding the uh, high school? I, well, I have one. I just looking at the searches, I was wondering, did you talk to the attorney about searching cell phones? Uh, no, not specifically. Just, just throwing that out there as something, <clears throat> sometimes that's evidence of uh, cheating on a test or something more dire like harassment or anything like that. And so it could be a violation of school rules on there. Just offering that Absolutely. as an observation. Yeah, that would not be a... Uh that would be something that would be good to have in the handbook, actually. Yeah. Good point. Any other questions? Okay. Are you looking at me? No, just, just <laughs> try on. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, we, um, we did take a vote. Uh, we take a vote on the elementary handbooks? Okay. So, I guess the question would be, does the committee wish to take this uh, on these? Uh, it's, it's on our agenda that we would take a vote to accept them, review them. Um, do you have any gu uh, guidance on that? I, yes, I, I would ask the committee, even though we've received advice that it may not be within the committee's proper purview to accept the handbooks, because I don't want to place a principal in a position of trying to enforce a handbook and then having someone say that it was never authorized. Got it. Um, yeah. my, my thought would be to have the school committee approve the handbooks tonight, to have the school councils approve the ha handbooks at their earliest convenience, and then we can do further research on how we should actually handle handbooks in the future. Makes sense. Yeah. So then I would accept a motion to approve the three handbooks that were presented this evening. So moved. Second. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you all for Thank coming you. in and presenting and for all the work you did. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is uh, a vote to accept um, gift. And this is uh, from the Leeds PTO. Uh, and this uh, is stonework around the new school sign, which we, uh, which we heard about at a previous meeting. And I'll turn it over to Principal Kanata. Okay, so I have, a, I guess, a dilemma. So I'm going to present it as such. So we do have, we were working with a stonemason by the name of Paul Corpita, who did our measurements, gave us our, um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? gave us our price, and uh, our PTO was strong behind this. For around $2,900 or so on the PTO would pay for it. We're looking at a 10 foot by three foot Goshen stone raised, um, I don't know what to call it, raised thing. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, so you're surrounding the, the sign itself, plantings and things. So. Unfortunately, uh, with, with the vendor, uh, he had some personal things that went on, so this has been put on the back burner and has not uh, begun yet. So the, the PTO is still looking at making this donation to have it done. However, they met um, last night and they threw it around again as to if mon money could be better spent on something else. So they still want to give a gift, but that gift may change. So I wasn't sure how to present that. And this was given me by my PTO president uh, last night. <coughs> So, so but would you would you like the committee to take no action on this matter? I think so. I just want to just be transparent and to say there's twenty nine hundred dollars that they want to spend on leads. Um, I would certainly report out whatever it is that would be bought. Um, for instance, we had a uh, a, um, a playground wall on on the uh, leads field uh, that had to be taken down due to safety reasons this summer, and that may be another allocation of the funds rather than do the the wall, maybe put the wall the wall ball or ball wall back up in the field. So j just some ideas to throw out there. So I'd rather table it and if you could table it and have no action for now and then I'd, I'd be more than happy to come back when we make a firm decision. Okay. Fine. Excellent. Thanks. 
I don't actually think we have to table. I think we can just uh, not take up, not take the vote as scheduled. So, um, unless there's a concern about that. I don't know. I thought when it said vote on here, we had to do something or get in trouble. But well, no, we huh? can't vote if it didn't say vote, right? <laughs> uh, well, I suppose. Um, yeah. I don't know what happens yeah. if you don't vote and it does say vote. I, I don't think we're required to. Okay. I, mean, I think I think we always have the pur the purview to change the agenda or to put something off so um, so I'm comfortable just moving beyond that so now the next vote is another gift this is uh, for Bridge Street School uh, a PTO $19,355 and this is toward the new playground um, and it also includes a vote related to a change order uh, relative to that same project um, and I might as well just announce that there's also a vote related to the playhouse for the playground, just to get them all out on the table. So uh, with that said, uh, I'll recognize uh, Principal Choquette and Mandy Gary from the PTO. Right. Um, so this has been a big learning curve for all of us to be putting this project together over the last year, year and a few months. You like and long education. It's a long education. <laughs> <laughs> the school of putting together a playground. Um, and uh, so we, um, I guess par part of all this stuff is that we had to apply for the CPA money going in with a set of plans that had estimates for everything. And as we all know, we have estimates and those estimates are off often. And so that's kind of what happened with a lot of this stuff is that we felt like we were in the range of a good estimate. Um, we only received one bid for this project, so we couldn't really turn that bid down with the essence of trying to get this done by the t start date of school. Um, so we did accept the bid. It came in higher than we thought, um, which ate up a lot more money in our budget than we were anticipating. Um, and uh, so we have um, raised additional monies as, as well as we've spent down our um, playground account that we had in reserves. Um, so that's so. The, the Mobius Climber was part of our initial idea for the playground, but the, um, the bid that came out was larger than we thought, so we spent more money than we thought. So. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part of that was the, uh, the, um, the gift of the playhouse. It has been a, a donation from, um, from a local construction company, and it's been approved by Greg Cohan as well. So. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so those are the initial set of votes that you're looking for the school committee to approve. Right. So the first is um, acceptance of the Mobius climber to approve this additional gift, which covers the Mobius right. climber, right. Right. Um, which you had initially tried to do but couldn't do. Right. Yeah. We actually call that it's called value engineering. It's sort of an <laughs> we had to do that in the police station project, which was you know twenty million dollar project, but you got all the bids in and then. You had to sit down with the architects and the engineers and say, right. "Okay, what can we? What do we have to remove in order to stay on budget?" So it happens right. in projects, right. big and small. So, but and obviously, we, we did think about going back to the CPA, and they did say that would be fine. But given the timeline, again, yeah. we only meet once over the summer, and it wouldn't have worked out if we'd gone back to them. And they would have been plenty willing to give us more money if we needed it, but we just couldn't make that. Happen. The time would have been tough. So it's great that you have additional donations that have come in to be able to well we did use up our reserve playground fund yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. okay okay so um, so I guess the first vote that's being asked for is uh, is to go ahead and accept this uh, uh, additional nineteen thousand three hundred and fifty five uh, dollars uh, toward the playground project is there a motion on that so moved. okay is there a second second okay. all those in favor say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that, that piece is down. Um, and then I, I assume that, that uh, the, the change order then sort of just follows from that. Right, um, that's the change order. Okay. I'm, so I'm not sure that we need to take that vote, we could, but we'll still we'll ask for a vote to approve that change order uh, to, the, uh, to the playground project that we initially approved. So, so moved. To add the climber. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. 
Okay, and now there's some additional um, some additional funding uh, issues uh, related to uh, signage um, and, and a playground bench as well. Um, so the next the item, play, the playhouse, the playhouse, oh, the playhouse also. Me, yes. And then a, a, I'd also like to motion uh, for for to accept the gift of a playhouse for the playground. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the uh, playhouse is accepted. The next is a vote to allow an amount not to exceed $1,500 uh, to be used from the B, uh, Bridge Street School before and after school program revolving account uh, toward the purchase of a playground bench. And um, I'll let uh, you speak so, to that. So once again, this bench was actually in the original bid that we all signed off on. Somehow when that bid document made its way to the city, that was dropped off of that document. We, I, we the bid that came to us had the bench. The one that we signed and off on said this is what this is including. The, the bid <laughs> that the contractor bid on did not include the bench. And we found out last week <laughs> that we would have to pay for that right. and so we're here asking we have um, an after school this is our dilemma <laughs> we have um, an after school fund um, that's not being used and we're asking if we can um, use up to the fifteen hundred dollars from that fund to cover the cost of cover the, the cost of the bench and this is our memorial bench um, for ESP that passed away okay blame it on the city <laughs> when in doubt. <laughs> uh, okay. So this um, is, um, who who's the administrator of the after school? We don't have uh, one at well, Bridge. He, Mika, is it my, well, the, it's, it's myself and Michaela, who's also part of this project, but she's in Europe right now. Um, Michaela and I uh, wrote an NEF grant and got um, a three-year small grant to run an after school program, and we ran it for two years. Um, we were interested in giving the work over to somebody else who wanted to volunteer and continue to run this program and nobody else was willing to take it on um, and we uh, just couldn't continue it ourselves so we um, took what was left and it was just in this account in an after school account we've actually used part of it also to purchase um, this past year because before we were able to do the playground renovations, we bought uh, a bunch of playground supplies just for the kids to have to do something out on the playground. So we've already used part of that for this, and there's some money remaining in the account. Just so we're asking to be put towards anyone this. Anyone Superintendent had a any comment. Yeah. If, um, just uh, to get to your original question, because I think I may know where you're going with this. Um, although the funds, I believe gen were generated through the PTO originally. They were placed in a before and after school revolving account that's under the control of the school department. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the request is here to release the money from that so okay. that it can be used for that purpose. And it, did the money really come from an NEF grant or did it come from fundraising done by the? Well, it's a mixture. I mean, part of it was tuitions from the program. Oh, okay. Part of it was, you know, just, we just had to, we were, we stopped sort of in the middle of the program because nobody was willing to take it on. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I think this would be a good use of the yeah. funds. I yeah. think that's a good yeah. thing, but I just wanted to, I was looking for the provenance of the funding yeah. because if it came from NEF for a specific grant to do right. something and you didn't do that right. by rights, you should ask them if it's okay with them if right. you spend it on something else. Right. Did you have to return Having it? been on the NEF board for many years, they tend to close out a grant at yeah. the end. Yeah, the end. grant has been closed. So I'm sure that they have closed closed out yeah. and any leftover so money I, have been accounted I, 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 and I yeah. think this is a worthwhile enough expenditure that mm -hmm. my guess is that NEF would approve of it I'm just yeah. asking about I, I just have a question too about I mean when we did purchase the playground equipment for the playground last when was it last spring we purchased a, um, a cart with balls and cones and hula hoops and stuff on it and we um, were not asked to get school committee approval on that. We just were asked to submit the receipt for what we wanted to buy right. to mm -hmm. um, business to the business office. Yeah, the, the business office at the time. So 
It's always better to ask for forgiveness than per permission. <laughs> so, uh, so it's fine. Would you like us to add that? We can add that. Maybe we do it as managers. One person thinks it's important to have the something, you know. So it may yeah. just have been a procedural. I guess the, that's what I'm asking is: yeah. Yeah. is there a procedure around this so, so that in the future we can know what? Yeah, because most of the time, if there's a revolving account for that thing, it's for that thing, right? right. right. So and you don't take it from that thing and put it in yeah. another thing, right? So right. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, I don't know. All part of the learning process. It is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it continues. Municipal finance. Okay, so um, so what we're asking then is a vote uh, from the school committee to allow this expenditure up to but not to exceed fifteen hundred dollars from that before and after uh, revolving account uh, to be used for the purchase of a playground bench. So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. I just I just want to go on record as saying that I really like after school programs for kids. I do too. And I wish that someone would step I, up I, and and continue that at Bridge Street School. I second so. that. I second but that. but <laughs> failing that, this seems like a good addition to the playground and a better use of funds than letting them sit in an account that nobody's doing anything with. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll vote on the main motion. All those in favor, say hi. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, and then next, uh, we have um, a gift related to um, signage for the new playground. Um, and this, uh, you have in your packet a picture of uh, the proposed sign for the new playground. And, uh, and so this would be a vote to accept um, a gift uh, from the PTO to, to actually pay for the purchase and installation of this sign. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions about that? It's a ground sign. Uh, welcome to the Bridge Playground. Uh, it does thank some of the uh, donors uh, to the to the sign. You guys want to see this? Yes. There it goes. Oh, there it goes. It, mine when I tried to download it. It went haywire. And, so, thank you. Sorry. Any questions or comments about that? Um, I'd yeah. like to say one thing. Sure. Um, I, I know there's been some um, discussion about whether it constitutes advertising um, on a thank you sign. And I, I think this is a part of a larger discussion that could be had um, with the school committee or the leadership team um, about that, I mean, it, there's, there's often big projects now that the school department cannot you know, fund. And so more often, go out and source that money from private donations. And private donations do want to be thanked. And, um, and that's been something we've come across. A lot of people have you know, asked us, how am I going to be recognized in this? Um, and I just think that needs to be a discussion. There needs to be some sort of policy or understanding or flexibility in policy around that. Um, I, I, flexibility in policy is really, really, you know, is really what I want to say about that. Um, because you know these things are being paid for more often by outside money. Um, we have an advertising policy, which none of these people have had to deal with, but I've dealt with it right. more times than I want to deal with it. It yeah. just keep. It's one of those things that it comes yeah. back every. It's sort of on a cycle yeah. about every eight yeah. years or something, and I think that it's. Uh, but I don't see this as. Advertising. Well, thank you. I, I, I don't think. Yeah. I think yeah. if somebody says, "I want to put a billboard on the side of right. my school right. or on the back right. of the school bus," that's advertising. Right. This is a donation that they've made, and I agree with you. It's absolutely appropriate to acknowledge a, a gift like that. You know, the question is, you know, if they say, "Okay, I'm giving you 15 computers, and I want a big sign on the side of the building," then you right. you kind of go, you know. But right. if you want a little plaque on each of those computers that they give you, that makes perfect sense to me. So in this particular instance, this doesn't seem like advertising to me. And I kind of hate to go into that advertising policy yeah. again if we don't have yeah. to. So yeah. I, this would, that would be my, my take on the whole thing. But I, I also agree with you that 
more and more often we're coming up with larger projects that do look for donations from individuals and businesses in the area. And I think um, I, I just had a brief conversation with the superintendent about this the other day, and I really think that it's important for, it, you know, education doesn't happen in a vacuum. Yeah, in a vacuum, exactly. And so I think that there are benefits to area businesses and individuals of our educational system. And we we don't have a PR person in the district that's going to, so it's, we kind of just, when we are doing something good and we think about it, we submit it to the newspaper and they may print it or right. not. Right. But it's kind of hard to get the word out there. And I think that it's important for us to remind businesses that they have an obligation to support education if indeed they intend to benefit from the fact that we are a desirable community in which so, to mm -hmm. live right. and work. And if they want to have students that are going to be good future employees mm -hmm. for them, I think, I mean, and just as it's our responsibility as citizens to make sure that we educate our kids. And this is, to my mind, that the, the kind of like social emotional uh, education, if the state doesn't care much about that anymore, but, but I'm glad that Northampton cares about it and is willing right. to support that. And we so. did really try to look for local donors rather than going we to did. any place like mm -hmm. Target or Home. Yeah. Right. We really tried to just stay yeah. within Locally. Northampton. Mm -hmm. um, it may be an incentive, too, for other businesses who see that, oh, this is happening. Maybe we should yeah. do this also. So we just step up and be part mm -hmm. of it. Right. In, a slight, in another context, though, so this is just for if we ever do revisit the advertising policy. <laughs> Um, a, a, a useful distinction for me between, yes. yeah, a useful distinction in my mind between acknowledging um, somebody's financial support and advertising for that person is, is um, if there's like a call to action. Right. So in other words, if it mm -hmm. if it says you know we thank so and so for their financial support and right. we give their name, that's acknowledgement. It's advertising if it says. So go buy something from right, them. Right, right, I agree with you. And, and I think that that's a, you know, a pretty big sort of distinction in terms of, it doesn't speak to the size of the sign, but it does speak to what it says on the sign. Yeah. And I think as long as it's acknowledging, you know, I think that's really appropriate. And then as long as you don't get the verb in there telling somebody what to do, right, <laughs> um, right. then you're not really, I think, you haven't really crossed the line into advertising. I think I think that not to start that discussion in this evening, but <laughs> but the, but the we'll have to finish it tonight anyway. The uh, program for the event, you know what? Mm -hmm. You know you're having a concert or you're having a play or something, and there's a program and there's stuff, and that's when we start wondering if buying an ad in a program that's advertising mm -hmm. and yeah. what's our policy on advertising? So. I don't want to violate the open meeting law because the advertising policy wasn't on the agenda tonight. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut this off. I'm gonna cut this off. It is a gnarly uh, issue. So um, so the issue before us then is the acceptance of the gift from the Bridge Street School PTO for the new sign for the playground. I just want to point out one thing because you know the, the handbooks put me in a proofreading state of mind. There are a couple of misspellings on this and I hope it's not the proof. It just no, this is not the proof. This is we have. As I said, I was in the room mind, so I have, to, I have to throw it out there. Sorry. Great. Okay. Oh, no. I do have another question. Okay. About the sign. Yeah. Um, you know, the playground is used by people yeah. throughout the day. Do do we have a place that sort of tells people that it's you know for the use of the school during school hours or any any sort of notification like that? Or do we want to have such a notification? It would be beneficial to have notification during. Certain hours that it's to use for, for, for the school. student, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know if the other Are others playgrounds do, do other have that. schools have that issue? That notification. I, I tend. I mean, I. It's I've never really. Say, but yeah, yeah, frequently. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, there so think of. I've never know. noticed to be a problem at certain mm -hmm. schools. Yeah. There were kids on the playground. A lot of them. Okay, so I can I have a motion to accept the gift of the uh, new to pay for the new signage at Bridge Street School Playground? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? Sure. Okay. Second. Seconded by Mr. Moore. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Can I just sure. Thing, I just wait, just to reiterate what um, Mandy had said about this being a learning process, which it sure has. Um, but I really just want to say that. 
the support that we've had from the community and people have donated to this project has been really overwhelming. I mean, people from all over the country who are friends of friends of parents of, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just want to have the opportunity to publicly thank people who have really took the time to see the importance of this for Bridge Street. And if you get time to pop over there, it's I can't get my nose out of my office window because I'm just watching them all along. <laughs> it's really wonderful to see and it's, um, I appreciate your support with this and um, how it's going to benefit all our kids. Yeah. And like, the kids in the community. Yeah, so it's, it's really going to make a huge difference in the everyday lives of the kids at Bridge Street School. And it's That's a really awesome. wonderful thing. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the approval of a new um, uh, memorandum of understanding, MOU, between the school committee and the Recreation Commission. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost to uh, discuss that. Thank you. In your packets, you'll see a draft of the new MOU that I'm recommending for your approval tonight. Uh, this replaces a document which I believe um, was dated 1999, uh, and that I understand has been the subject of discussion between the school department and the rec, rec department for a long time. Uh, my entry to this discussion was a city stat meeting that I attended in which um, the focus of the meeting was the aquatic center, and one of the um, requests made at the time was if we could update the agreement between the schools and the um, rec department concerning the aquatic center. Uh, there were a couple of items um, in particular that I would draw your attention to. One is in section one, having to do with the hours that the uh, aquatic facility will be open to use for non-school purposes. Um, this was a, a change that was requested because um, community users needed a sufficient sufficiently late time in the morning um, to get in and out of the pool, but there was a conflict with school security um, because we had no way um, really to segregate the population that was using it for uh, aquatic center from the rest of the students. Um, so we had a negotiation session um, with Leslie Wilson, Amory Maggio, Greg Cohen, Jim Miller, Kara Dupree, and myself, and we talked about alarming the exterior doors to the locker rooms so that users would enter through the main doors, and then if they exited into the building when students were there, an alarm would go off so that teachers in the area could, you know, make sure that the kids were safe. My, my expectation is that would only happen because someone went out the wrong door not you know not that they intended any ill will but we have to provide a certain measure of safety and security for our students so we felt that um, with the addition of that alarm system which is described in here we would be able to provide the hours of usage um, that are described there without impacting the school schedule um, the second piece that I would draw your attention to is the communication methods that are all described in section three um, for keeping a common calendar of events between the rec department and the schools so that we can highlight conflicts um, and have an opportunity to resolve them before we have two different groups showing up to try to use the same facility at the same time other than that um, the main the main um, foundations of the agreement are still the same. Um, the Northampton School Department still has priority for scheduling for all of the facilities. Um, the Recreation Department uh, is a partner with us in that and we will work with them through communication in order to um, maximize their access to the facilities as well. And um, my understanding from that um, negotiation session is that the Rec Department feels that this would meet their needs I think it certainly meets our needs. Um, and so the way I would envision this going forward is if the school committee would approve tonight, then the rec commission could approve the MOU as well. And then we would move forward with alarming and, and setting up the new schedule. Okay. And I just want to thank uh, Dr. Provost for, uh, for his work and, and bring this together. I'm, I was I invited him to come to one of our staff meetings to talk about some of the issues that were happening and some of the concerns we had about, you know, revenue at the pool um, and the fact that, you know, the contraction of the hours had had an impact and we lost some folks um, because of the hours. So I really appreciate him 
um, sort of mediating this and, and bringing all the parties together to work out a solution. Because, you know, legitimate concerns about security, building security, uh, but also legitimate concerns about the use of the pool, which, you know, the voters of the community, when they voted for the override to build the school, it was quite a subject of debate that this was going to be a community pool as well that the community would have access to. So I want to just thank you very much uh, for, for helping bring this forward. Mrs. Minnick. My biggest question about the whole thing is maintenance and at not, not routine, normal, ongoing day-to-day -day mm -hmm. maintenance, <coughs> but the capital improvements that are required to bring, is, because didn't the, we had something go wrong with the thing on the roof not a couple of years ago, I mean, and those are significant expenses. And I believe that the school department I mean, we did get an override that paid for the thing, and I think we should have anticipated that there would be some costs for ongoing, long-term capital mm -hmm. maintenance of the thing. But um, I also think that when uh, that we are, uh, given the situation that the schools are in, we don't collect extra revenue from the state for having a pool here. We <coughs> don't have any way to... <laughs> it's not like we can just put a box out front and say, please put your donations here for pool maintenance and have it be enough. So, I mean, we, and there's not room. I mean, we're cutting staff and we're not buying textbooks when we need to. So there's not a place for significant expenditures. And so we need to be looking at how we do that. And when you consider that there are a fair number of users that come from the Recreation Department, I just want to be sure that we're looking at what we're going to do to budget for. Well, the city, uh, the city pays for all the major capital improvement costs for the pool out of the capital improvement program. Right. We're actually in the process this year of installing a new Dectron unit, which is six-figure piece of equipment that that controls all of the way that the chlorination and everything happens. So, okay. so that's um, done through the capital it's through the capital improvement process. program exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the the day to day maintenance uh, is is performed by school personnel. Um, you may recall after the override, the school took over paying the weekend custodian. Um, so we're funding that as well. And I guess the way I would look at it is that if you, you know, that the the if. You, if you said the community was never going to use the pool again today, um, the, the, the cost would be the same to have a pool in the school right. and to provide a pool for right. students and to provide a pool for you know gym classes, et cetera. Because you have to run the filter 24 hours a day, you have to use the same amount of chemicals, et cetera. So I don't. I think the I think the maintenance issue is is you know I, I don't believe it's a drain on this on the school budget in any way because the major capital costs are covered out of the city capital improvement program so well, I think that so and, and I think the day-to-day -day maintenance is reasonable and I mm -hmm. think that clearly as you said the six hundred thousand dollar thing is mm -hmm. capital improvements I guess I'm talking about the five thousand dollar thing that broke or the you know when it gets to be more expensive than we had anticipated or budgeted for, but it's not big enough to qualify as capital improvements, that's when I wonder how we how we balance that if there's a sharing in some way of that. So okay, and and I don't I don't see that sort of stuff addressed in the MOU, and maybe it can't be. Maybe that's something that we work out when the time comes that there's something that goes haywire. So okay. I just, well, we we are tracking we are tracking that data pretty closely about okay. the pool and pool maintenance and and um, sort of that smaller maintenance versus larger maintenance. So I can and I mean I hear what you said about that, that if if the community quit using the pool tomorrow, the cost for the maintenance would be the same. But then again, if we thought that the community were ever going to quit using the pool. I'm not sure that we would have put a pool in a school. Mm -hmm. You know, we we did it because we could, because it was going to be a shared usage community pool. Yeah. But we need, and we got the support of the community to install the pool, and I'm forever grateful. But now I think we need continued support from the community to maintain that mm -hmm. pool if it's going to be useful. Yeah, the and the rec future. department so, does from its from its revenue does uh, contribute money back to the city budget that goes toward these kinds of capital maintenance okay. costs as well 
from the user fees that they collect. So, yeah, because so. I realized too that they are they have to raise their own money. They do, and they're also trying to keep the programs right. affordable right. for people. So I don't want to put them in a position of saying you all have to pay for this maintenance, and they have to like jack the fees yeah, up. And, exactly, yeah, because exactly. that doesn't serve our community yeah. well. But the schools don't have any other, mm -hmm. you know, stones to squeeze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Blood from. I didn't say that. I was trying, you can't squeeze blood from a stone, so there are no more stones to squeeze blood from. Well, sorry for it. Whatever. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Thank um, God. Just, uh, if you, I think it's for you, uh, for John Provost. Um, the, how did we sort of arrive at these times of the 8 o'clock and 8.15, you know, given that uh, classes start at 8 o'clock. Do we not have P classes first period or what's, what's it, happening? It's based on the JFK PE schedule um, and my understanding is that we've had that same PE schedule for pool usage for several years. So our first sort of filter was does this work for the JFK PE program and it does. Well that actually left me wondering um, not to be an advocate for the recreation department but if on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays they could actually go later than that, you know, further into the first period, you know. I, th I think we wanted to have, we wanted to set the, the closing so that there would be sufficient time to exit the area for all of the non-school users, knowing that if you say the pool is closing at, you know, 7.30 or 8.30, whatever it is, some people will take time getting out of the pool, take time in the locker room, and we wanted to leave a little bit of a, a gap there. Well, I was assuming that we, we say use the aquatic facility, that includes the locker room? It does. So, mm -hmm. so essentially, the, the locker room closes for rec department use at 8 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's right. Closes at 8.15 on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's right. Any other questions about, um, about the Paul, the MOU? Okay, so hearing none, um, I would request a vote to um, approve the MOU between the school committee and the Recreation Commission. I move approval of the memorandum of understanding. Okay. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? I just want to echo your gratitude to the superintendent for working with the rec department to do this because it is something that's been hanging out there for like, I think, two years now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the MOU is approved. Next item is a vote um, to release a series of executive session minutes, and actually on the back of the posted agenda, there's a complete list. These are ones that, uh, uh, for the public, uh, these are uh, minutes of meetings that were held in executive session where the um, legal reason for holding the executive session no longer um, exists, uh, whether it's a, a collective bargaining that's been completed, whether it's a, a real estate transaction that's been transacted, or whether it's uh, any other number, litigation that's been settled, et cetera. And so under the law, we are required to approve and release them. So these are minutes that have been approved by the board in executive session, and now we're just going to announce their release or vote to actually release them publicly. Uh, I'll quickly just run through the dates uh, for the public. Uh, January 13, 2011, March 10, 2011, March 21, 2011, April 14, 2011, April 28, 2011, May 12, 2011, May 26, 2011, June 9, uh, 2011, June 23, 2011, July 14, 2011, August 11, 2011, September 8, 2011, October 13, 2011, November 10, 2011, June 14, 2012, June 28, 2012, March 28, 2013, April 11, 2013, May 9, 2013, May 14, 2013, June 13, 2013, June 20, 2013, and July 11, 2013. We then have minutes from the Superintendent Screening Committee from February 24, 2014 
and uh, March 3rd, 2014. Uh, we also have minutes from the negotiating subcommittee of March 3rd, 2014 and March 13th, 2014. And then we have one final set of school committee meeting minutes from March 13th, 2014. So I would request a motion um, to uh, formally release uh, publicly this set of executive session minutes. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Could I just express my gratitude to you and the superintendent and particularly to Laura. I think she was the one who had to dig through the, mm -hmm. the archives and find all of these and I know it wasn't easy. So definitely we're trying to us, do some get uh, us a little bit cleaned up here. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much, Laura. Okay. Um, I think we voted. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, good. Aye. Voted. Excellent. Okay. All right. So now we'll move into the report phase of the meeting and I believe uh, Dr. Provost will be delivering um, the business manager report in addition to his own report this evening. That's correct, thank you. I'd like to begin my financial report by circling back to three questions that were posed in the July meeting, about the July financial report, um, regarding three accounts in particular that were negative at the time. One was the uh, regular ed transportation. I had said at the time that um, my Initial investigation of that was that when transportation was re-added at the high school, um, that line item was not increased to reflect the additional buses. That was the case. Um, the second was a line item that ha had not been used at all, it was for raises. That was because we had not gotten to the final payroll of the year yet. Um, and given the size of the raises, they were not, uh, those accounts were not needed until we got into the actual last check of the year. And the third item was private school tuition, um, which was um, in the def in deficit because it had not been charged back to circuit breaker yet. Um, as you know, we build our budget with anticipation of circuit breaker funds for special education tuitions. So there was a journal entry to charge those um, tuitions back to the circuit breaker that had not taken place yet. So that th those resolve um, those issues and I think close out FY14. The report in front of you shows our financial activity to date on FY15. Um, we, one thing I'd like to point out is that Munis is not rolled over to FY15 yet, so none of the accounts are populated. So everything appears to be in the deficit, but it's not. It's just because there's no initial funding figures in those um, accounts yet. Um, so in all, we've spent 934,000 spent or encumbered 934,000. That represents about 3.5 percent of the um, in total appropriated funds, and is a good place to be at this point in the year. One of the categories here, I think, is um, a little bit misleading. At least it was misleading to me. Um, the principal expenditures of 145,000 actually represents all of the school-based 12-month employee salaries. Um, oh. The next um, largest item you'll see is custodial expense. In fact, many of the things are custodial or maintenance. As you, I'm sure, saw walking into the building tonight, summer is the time when a lot of the custodial work is done. So that is the, the majority of the remainder of the spending. So um, I see nothing here that's out of the ordinary. Just um, wanted to sort of give you an update on where we stand at this point in time. Any questions about the, uh, about the business report? Okay. Personnel report, I guess, is yes. the next item. So for July 2014, we had seven new hires, including me, 10 separations, no retirements, and no promotions or transfers. And now the superintendent report. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to make the public aware of some important dates that are coming up. First, August 20th and 21st are the administrative retreat. School committee members are welcome and encouraged to join us on August 21st from 3.15 to 7 p.m. Um, the first day for new teachers will be August 26th, including a bus ride around Northampton so that they can get a chance to know the community. August 27th is convocation, and August 28th is a professional development day for staff 
August 29th is a day off for um, school year employees and the first day of school is September 2nd. I'd also like to uh, bring to your attention a small error in the school calendar that was approved that was uh, pointed out by Brian Lombardi. Um, in March, the um, dates that are identified for MCAS are March 17th, 18th, and 19th. These are the dates that appear right below the month. Those are actually the incorrect dates. The dates are listed correctly at the bottom of the calendar as um, March 24th through 26th. So we will be correcting the calendar, and I don't think it requires a vote, but I just wanted um, you to know that we would be making that change to the school year calendar so that it's clear for everybody um, when they have their late start days and when they don't um, for MCAS. Next, I'd like to update you on my entry plan. So far, I've conducted a total of 74 meetings asking the same four questions that some of you have been good enough to answer for me. Um, I've tentatively scheduled parent forums for September 15th and 23rd. Once I'm able to firm up the times and venues, I'll be um, sharing more information about the parent forums. I've also been diving deeply into documentary sources, uh, including assessment results, teacher evaluations, and school budgets. I've been enjoying the time, especially that I've been able to spend this week working with our school's data teams at East Hampton High School, um, where there's a school-based team from each of the schools uh, looking at the results from the most recent MCAS and looking at what that says about changes they can make in curriculum and instruction to make learning more powerful in the upcoming year. Um, they've been it, looking into some of the same questions that I've been looking into as a result of my review. So it's been interesting to share our insights. And I want to just say that the conversations that are taking place this week are so powerful. Um, the sort of framework for the whole professional development event was vulnerability and being able to uh, be open to our fallibility as human beings and as educators. And I think that's a real rich vein for professional growth because um, when you're open to the idea that maybe we could do some things better, um, then positive change can happen. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that's going on this week at East Hampton High School. And um, I'm looking forward to touching base, hopefully, with the teams again tomorrow. Um, and I'm sure that you know it's just going to enrich the work that I'm doing with the entry plan. I'd also, um, uh, along the theme of things that we could do better, um, and an experience that I think we all had tonight, um, I'd like to give you an update on our Wi-Fi. Um, one of the one of the contracts that you approved tonight was for um, Wi-Fi of the high school, which our um, aspirational goal is to have that ready to go for the opening of school. Um, we also, um, Angelo and his staff have been working very hard to get the rest of the district caught up with Wi-Fi coverage. And our other goals this year are um, to get um, Leeds and JFK um, completely covered with Wi-Fi by this fall and winter and to take care of the rest of the schools in the spring. Um, so it is going to be a big push to go from islands of Wi-Fi connectivity within schools to campus-wide coverage district-wide, but I think it's you know an essential step that we need to take in order to provide a 21st century education, so we're going to keep pushing on that. Also, I uh, want to give you an update on our MSBA projects for the um, roof repairs. Um, we got the exciting news that we've been advanced to the feasibility study. Um, that's not final approval, but it's a step in the process. At this point, the MSBA will assign an owner's project manager and an architect for us to work with to determine whether or not um, it's feasible for the MSBA to work with us on the projects. And I just want to um, ask for the committee's consensus here because I have worked with um, both accelerated repair and green repair. And what happens is you get a number of notices that are essentially commitments and statements of assurances that need to be returned on a very short timeline. 
um, usually within a week or 14 days. Um, and I don't think it's feasible for the committee to review and talk about all of the commitments that are going to be required of us if we go forward with the plan. So um, I have signed the initial state of statement of assurances for the feasibility study. And I just ask if you're comfortable with me having the authority to sign um, those other documents on your behalf. Um, and just to advise you as they're coming in and let you know if anything seems out of the ordinary and would require the full committee discussion. I see lots of heads nodding, so okay. uh, I, I was just curious. Uh, I agree, but uh, what sort of things are they going to be checking from? This is roof construction, right? So um, the the essential um, statement of assurances, which was four was four pages and probably twenty different assurances, basically all said we'll play by the rules. You know, that will do the feasibility study, will work with the owner's project manager and the architect who are identified by the MSBA. Essentially, that will go along with the program that they have in place in order to provide reimbursement for the projects. And then in the future, the sorts of things would be? Um, in the future, there will be a, uh, I'm not sure how long the project would last if we get it, but typically um, there are bill schedules that are done on a biweekly schedule. So it's, you know, assurance that the work that is being billed for is work that was actually done, so on and so forth. And then um, the last item that I have on my agenda tonight is um, my proposal to you for impact rating. Um, we had a very productive meeting with the association um, concerning enabling language for DDMs in the um, teacher's contract. As you know, the district has submitted its DDMs as required by the state, but is yet to finalize language that would um, describe how we're going to use them in the evaluation process. I would um, characterize that first meeting as very productive. We're meeting again on August 25th, and my hope is to bring forward some language in September that the school committee could approve and hope, hopefully to get a ratification vote from the association shortly thereafter. But one of the things that became very um, obvious from those discussions is um, more communication and education about what DDMs mean is essential um, for us to be able to move forward. And so I would ask you for the honor of being the first one within the district um, to go through the process of setting DDMs. Um, so uh, basically the first piece of information in your packet describes how this works. Um, it's sort of a, a two-dimensional evaluation system. So you have the four standards and the four ratings on each of the standards that identify an educator as either exemplary, proficient, needs improvement, or unsatisfactory. And then the new piece that the DDMs bring is within each of those four categories, you can be either low impact, modern impact, or high impact based on um, the growth that students are able to attain as a result of your work. Um, now, it's not an achievement measure per se. It's just growth. So it's not about getting kids to a certain point on a test like MCAS is. It's looking at how much change do you see from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, in addition, the impact rating needs to be based on at least two different measures. It can be more than two different measures, but it has to be at least two. And it has to be over at least two different years. Um, so the idea is that you're providing enough different measures and enough of a span of time that you're really looking at the educator and not looking at the effect of a class that might have been, you know, a really exceptionally talented group of students or just a bad mix of students. Um, and so the way the process works is um, the educator meets with the evaluator, or in this case, evaluating body, and proposes um, the DDMs to be used. Um, before I talk about the DDMs that I'm going to propose for myself, I want to point out in the first figure in your packet, the only consequence for educators is for those who are prof proficient or exemplary whether they're on a one-year self-directed plan or two-year self-directed plan. If a 
teacher is in the needs improvement category, they're on a directed growth plan regardless of what the impact rating is. And if, a if an educator is unsatisfactory, they're on an improvement plan regardless of what the impact rating is. So the only difference um, is whether it's a one-year plan directed by the educator or a two-year plan still directed by the educator. <coughs> so one of the things that I'd like to communicate to teachers is don't get overwrought about this um, because all that the only difference for you in your evaluation if your impact comes up to be low is you'll be meeting with the principal earlier on in that process to say okay that didn't work the way I thought it was going to what can we try different in order to um, get the students growing and for superintendents it's extremely low um, consequence because we're always on a one-year directed play anyway, so, uh, so I feel very confident being the first one to go forward. Um, so what I've done is identified uh, three groups where I think um, we could make an impact. It's, a, it's at a very fine level of granularity and you might wonder whether or not that's appropriate for a superintendent, but when you consider data all in the aggregate, it just all gets smushed towards average and you lose um, you lose the sense of where you could make an impact. Um, so I have three groups where the growth seems low and as superintendent I'd like to try to improve the growth. First is our grade four ELA for the students with disabilities subgroup. The second is the grade six all students in mathematics and the third is grade 10 ELA for the high needs students. I've given you some information on the historical data and I've pointed out that since this is a two-year process, I can't really identify with certainty what the measure for 2016 will be because it may be PARC or it may be MCAS or maybe something else. Um, but um, if, if we should have to change to PARC, there is a process called um, equivariate linking, something like that, that says basically you'll be able to get a number from PARC that is comparable to a number from MCAS for the purpose of determining impact ratings. Uh, one thing I don't like about this is I don't have a real indirect measure um, and I was talking with Barbara Black about having some kind of a measure of uh, social emotional growth at the preschool level um, but I and we're thinking about that but we're just not there with our metrics as a district yet so in future versions of this I may want to add that back in but um, Respectfully, this is what I'd like to submit tonight and ask you to um, assess my impact based upon. Okay. Any comments or questions uh, from the committee on the, the report generally, but this particular matter? I thought your target areas were great. I mean, Thank you. appropriate and very interesting. Ms. Minnick? I think it's interesting that we have to have a class on how to understand yeah. Yeah. what the requirements are for yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. doing mm -hmm. so absolutely I'm just I'm just saying yeah, well, <laughs> and, yeah. and we may need further uh, yeah, we may need continuing education on reasons. that um, as a committee to work with you on this particular <laughs> process um, my sense would be we would have with this do we traditionally have a um, a review committee uh, that's that works with the well, superintendent just, subcommittee? Let me ask this question first. This doesn't replace this just as in addition to that whole big long category That's of right. okay. stuff that you have mm -hmm. to do. So right. that was like 24 different or 30, so I forget. It was mm -hmm. some large number of things. Okay. Do you remember that where it had the description of what proficient looks mm -hmm. like? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, so, so and I, I want to say that our, our former superintendent picked out six or eight of those that he was going to focus on but really you're supposed to be grading on all of them but you can only focus on mm -hmm. some number of them if you want to make change if, you know measurable or identifiable change in those so and he did have a group of I think three school committee members who were meeting with him to assess mm -hmm. okay. his so we'll progress have to, on those things so the question yeah. becomes okay. then okay oh i did okay 
Thank you for reminding me. A superintendent evaluation, evaluation committee. committee. Okay. I think I'm on it. <laughs> Yeah, I knew I was on it. Well done. Here we are. Um, okay, excellent. So, we'll, um, do you think? Do you are are you seeking a vote this evening, or to formally accept these, or it's, it's, or um, it sounds like there's comfort with moving forward as you're proposing it? I I would love to. Um, just for your information, before bringing these forward, I shared them with the alt team. Um, because obviously if I'm going to be judged by them, I'm going to need their help in yeah. impacting those um, groups. And I would say they've been energized by these focus areas. Um, so I, I think it would be just add further um, uh, momentum to that, that process we have rolling forward if we could get a vote from the committee approving these areas. Okay. So would someone like to make a motion to yeah. accept these proposed impact ratings for the superintendent? What's that? Yeah, that is one issue. It, it, it was not on the agenda, per se, that we'd be voting on this tonight. It sort of, sort of came out of the superintendent report. So that would be one, that would be one issue, I think, that he raises correctly. Um, so I'm not sure how you want to handle that. Could we have a sense of the committee? I think we could certainly have a sense of the committee. And, um, I'm seeing lots of heads nodding. Uh, so we can't take a formal vote. Any uh, anyone have any reservations about uh, moving forward with this? We could certainly take a formal vote at our next meeting, sure. but I think it sounds like we could move forward with this. Um, the committee could perhaps begin to 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 think about a meeting to to begin working with you on this. Okay. Yeah. Thank Excellent. you. That concludes my report. Excellent. Okay. Is there? I don't believe we have any new business scheduled for this evening. Um, so uh, the only other items on the agenda is just to remind you about the ALT retreat and specifically the school committee's uh, uh, invitation to participate on August 21st at 3 p.m. and that's again at uh, Smith College at their conference center. And then the next school committee meeting is on September 11th, 2014 right here at JFK Community Room at 715. I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I second. Non-debatable motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.